Good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Uh, here us from Geneva. My name is Christiana Stefan Gallen from Monktet. And I would like to welcome you all to this launch event of our new global initiative, Family Business for Sustainable Development. This is also the topic for the overall session uh, for the next two hours. Allow me first to outline to you what you will be expecting in these two hours um, and, uh, and uh, read you through. You have the program on the website and uh, now the latest. We're delighted to have with us two eminent keynote speakers who will open the event and help frame the global context for then the subsequent discussion um, on family business um, and sustainable development. We will then hear from the very people who have to shape the future of their enterprises and our common future, namely uh, the family businesses themselves, the CEOs, and also the um, uh, experts. And then I hope you will be staying with us for the official presentation and launch of our joint UNCTAD and FBN initiative, Family Business for Sustainable Development. The event will be streamed and recorded on Facebook Live, and we will also put the recording up for those who haven't had a chance to be with us today. But first, I would like to introduce now the co-hosts and the co-chairs of our new initiative, and that is um, Director James Chan from UNCTAD. He is the Director of Investment and Enterprise, and also he is the co-chairman of our executive board for the family business. James, good morning, good afternoon. Over to you, please. Thank you very much, Christian. Professor Sachs, Professor Cortes, and the members of the Advisory Council, Mr. Forbes, the president of Family Business Network International, and Alfonso, my fellow co-chair, distinguished panelists and the participants. It is my honor to welcome you to the first Family Business for Sustainable Development Conference. And this is jointly organized by UNCTAD and the Family Business Network International. Our conference today takes place at the beginning of the decade of delivery on the Sustainable Development Goals. With less than 10 years to go, progress on achieving SDGs by 2030 is scant. What has been achieved so far is threatened to be upended by the devastating impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Dealing with this crisis and building forward better, for inclusive and sustainable recovery require, uh, require engaging the full spectrum of investment development stakeholders. Each and every link in the investment chain needs to work towards bridging the financing gap for the goals. This includes policymakers, investment treaty negotiators, investment promotion agencies, development banks, stock exchanges, investment funds owners and managers as well as multinational enterprises, SMEs, and family business as we have today. This across the board engagement with all the key players of the entire sustainable investment chain is the core of our vision. It is the rationale for our World Investment Forum and our engagement with you, the family business community. Upstream engagement, for example, includes our UN Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative, bringing together over 100 partner exchanges worldwide with its 55,000 listed companies with a collective market capitalization exceeding 90 trillion US dollars. Similarly, we engaged with institutional investors, global asset owners, including sovereign wealth and pension funds, forging a kind of how um, sustainable finance and the long-term institutional investment could be leveraged to contribute to a more sustainable and inclusive economy. Yet the capital markets and the sustainability impact funds do not automatically connect with 
non-listed family businesses. And it's a huge global force for good. This leaves a large systemic gap between the upstream and the downstream of the investment chain for sustainable development. Therefore, our daunting task to effectively in, uh, bringing on board the family business community, which already contributed to over 70% of the global economy. It is this rationale that led us in 2019 to formalize UNCTAD and FBN joint endeavor by establishing the overall framework for the global initiative, the family business for sustainable development. Alfonso, we have come a long way since our first uh, brainstorming on the initiative in Barcelona in May 2019 and assigning the framework agreement in Geneva in December 2019. I firmly believe that um, the, uh, the global sustainability and the business prosperity, uh, family prosperity are the two sides of the same coin. Um, I'm looking forward to introducing our global initiative at the second segment of this conference. Thank you. Back to you, Christian. Thank you, James, for this um, overview. Now I would like to introduce or introduce um, Alfonso uh, Libano Daurella, as James has already mentioned. He was the driving force and the visionary behind making out of a discussion how family businesses could be supported, also a program and a, um, a program and also team up with the United Nations for this initiative. Alfonso is the vice chairman of Cobega Spain, and he's also um, the co-chairman of the executive board of our new initiative. Alfonso, over to you. Alfonso? Alfonso, you are muted. I would like to see you. Can we All right, uh, I had a technical problem. Okay, that's it, sorry. Okay. Thank you, James. And thank you all for joining us today. Probably more than or around 500 people are on this call, uh, our first call in, in this webinar. I'm excited to share some thoughts on why I believe family business are uniquely positioned to lead the change and contribute to the sustainability development goals. First and foremost, I know both from personal experience and by my colleagues at Family Business Network that the sustainability agenda is deeply aligned with the values of family business, both as owners and operators both we focus for the long term, for the value for the long term and creation, because our businesses also represent our legacies, or as we like to say at FPN, we think in generations, not in quarters. Just as importantly, we represent a scale that cannot be matched by any other collection of firms. Two thirds of the business worldwide are family owned or managed by families, employing 60 or 70% of the workforce of the private sector and generating 70 to 90% of the global GDP. Of course, these statistics also mean that family businesses have an even greater responsibility to do business in the right way, work for the good. Through our efforts in quality job creation, fair contracts and ethical investments, family businesses have continually earned the social license to operate and make a profound and positive influence in society across generations. Yet we know more can be done and it will be done. This is why Family Business Network first embarked on a sustainability journey 
over 10 years ago with the creation of our pledge for a sustainable future and Polaris, our sustainable initiative. Since then, we have worked to empower our community, our FBN and family business community of enterprising business owners, which brings together over 5,000 business families from across 65 countries. Collectively, we have shared best practice to do better understand the positive impacts we can achieve when we work together in order to get the common goal. Our current focus is on expanding our capabilities on sustainability reporting and encouraging high levels of transparency for all family businesses, no matter where they are on the sustainability journey. But as with any good entrepreneur, we are looking to continuously improve our efforts and take them to the next level, which is why we set out to find the best partner here with us to help us to do this. And we were fortunate to find the perfect fit, and this is contact. Thank you, James. James and I will share with more details our partnership a bit later in the program. So for now, I thank you again for joining us and look forward to hearing from you and from hearing also our distinguished group of speakers that will come afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alfonso. James and Alfonso will later in the program then introduce more details about the, the partnership and will also share with you what we're expecting from it. Now I have the pleasure to introduce you to the first of our keynote speakers, and um, that is Professor Jeffrey Sachs. And um, I don't think he needs much introduction. He's well known as an author, a renowned economist, an educator, and one of the leading, world's leading authorities on sustainable development. He's the director currently of the Columbia Center on Sustainable Development and the president of the UN Development Solutions Network. And as he has earlier shared with us, he has also advised a number of uh, family enterprises in the past. Uh, Jeffrey, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule now and also your willingness to support us with the initiative in the future. Thank you for joining. Over to you, Jeffrey. Thank you. It's, it's a great pleasure uh, to be with you, uh, not only today, but on this journey. Uh, the Family Business Network and the partnership with UNCTAD are inspiring and very important. And both uh, James and Alfonso have laid out the great potential of this vast uh, part of society. Uh, to do good and how important it is for family businesses to engage in the challenge of sustainable development. We are absolutely uh, at a, uh, a historic time for humanity, not only the drama of the COVID-19 pandemic, but the need to change course in the world and how we operate, how we operate as a uh, global connected civilization for our own good and especially for the good of our children and future generations. Uh, we know that the world economy produces great wealth, but it fails badly in two important ways. It does not by itself ensure uh, social justice and inclusion. So many people are left behind in suffering and deprivation and it does not ensure even our survival because of the vast environmental crises that have uh, been uh, brought to bear because of the way the economic system functions. Uh, COVID-19 is uh, of course a reflection of that, a disruption of nature, a new emerging disease that has jumped from an animal population of horseshoe bats to humans with devastating consequence, but we have, in addition to these zoonotic events, these emerging diseases, three other massive 
environmental crises that we're all painfully aware of, human-induced climate change, the destruction of biodiversity, and the mega pollution uh, that uh, kills millions, even though we don't uh, see it so dramatically. Uh, recent reports have shown that air pollution uh, claims that perhaps one out of every five premature deaths uh, in the world, massive uh, disease and suffering and mortality. So we're trying to change course. And uh, this is a crucial year for that because we have important global diplomacy. We have the uh, COP26, which is the climate summit in Glasgow in November. We have a world food system summit to try to help make our global agricultural and food system sustainable. And how many family businesses are engaged in that all over the world? Uh, a huge number of important family businesses. Uh, we have the so-called COP 16, 16th meeting of uh, the uh, parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity. I'm sorry, COP 15, excuse me, which will be hosted by China. Uh, and all of this is an attempt to change course. At the same time, business everywhere is realizing we have to change course. And James already explained how many deep initiatives are underway, whether it's in the stock markets, whether it is the business roundtable and the WEF and others redefining the very uh, nature and purpose of the corporation, uh, whether it is environmental uh, sustainable and governance investing, ESG investing, whether it is the way that huge money managers uh, like BlackRock uh, are calling on businesses everywhere to change course, because these environmental and social crises are fast becoming overwhelming and even irreversible if we don't get them under control. Uh, as uh, Christiane has mentioned, I've had wonderful experience with leading family businesses who understand how crucial values are to their families, to their businesses, to uh, the long-term uh, prospering of those businesses, and to their own responsibility as leading moral agents, citizens, uh, leading figures in their communities. So I'm absolutely thrilled to be part of this important partnership of UNCTAD and the Family Business Network and the call to family businesses all over the world, the millions of family businesses, to say that this is a time for leadership of family businesses in the communities, with government, in the marketplace, to help us create that new framework of global sustainable development. Uh, we have to do it, but there's also something very ennobling and enriching in being part of the effort. And I'm so thankful to leading family businesses for rising to this occasion. Christian, thank you so much uh, for letting me uh, share a few brief remarks this morning, and uh, especially to all my colleagues for letting me be part of this exciting journey, uh, which is starting today and which is going to produce phenomenal results in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, for your statement today and also for the continued support and your enthusiasm for family business. Um, you've given the perfect lead over, as you said, what is needed now, it's time for leaders. And I think uh, we couldn't have anybody better as our second keynote speaker, and that is Dame Polly Curtis, who is joined. She's the founder director of the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainable, Sustainability Leadership. She's joining us from Cambridge, um, and the Institute over the last 30 years um, has become the center of excellence for sustainability leadership and um, in particular also for family businesses. And I understand that there are already generations of next generation family business students have come 
through your institute. So I'm sure a lot will recognize the language that you have in common. Thanks, over to you, Polly, thank you. Uh, thank you, Christiane, and uh, thanks, Jeff, for that brilliantly clear and uh, rather sobering overview of the challenges we face, but also for reminding us that there are some key moments over the next few years, in fact, over the next year, where we can come together uh, to do something about it. And the reality is that many of those system challenges and shocks that you've spoken about are going to dog us for the whole of the rest of this century. But we can't do what we have so often done in the past, and that is leave it to the next generation to worry about. As you've said, the time for us to act is right now. In fact, um, as David Attenborough said recently, what each one of us does in the next few years will determine our future in the next few thousand years. It will define our legacy to all future generations. And I find this notion hugely inspiring and I'm particularly excited by this partnership between UNCTAD and the Family Business Network because it taps into the intergenerational power of families and family wealth as a means of delivering the SDGs and addressing some of the existential risks that we face. I actually think that the sustainability movement and I include myself here has over the years become brilliantly good at selling the problem. That's gathering the data and reminding us of the devastating impacts that humans have had on the natural world. And for all the benefits that economic growth has brought, reminding us of the fact that for millions of people around the world, life is pretty close to unbearable. But it doesn't have to be like that. We have to focus more on the solutions. We're not simply victims of the future, trapped in an unchangeable system. We have the capacity right now, as Attenborough says, to determine our future for the next few thousand years. And perhaps now more than ever in this current crisis, as 7.8 billion of us face this unique moment in history together, as we're reminded of just how fragile our social, political and economic systems really are, perhaps now we will seize the opportunity to reset the system, recast our economy, find ways to grow resilient industries, create good jobs and deliver a more fair and equal society. But I think it's really important that if we're going to achieve this, that we don't project the challenge as simply a burden that we have to carry. When I meet students and hear of their genuine concern, even their fear about the future, I also point out to them that there has never been a more exciting time to be alive. This is the generation that still has time to make a difference, that gets to reinvent everything that can be part of changing the way we live, what we consume, what we build, how we communicate, and what we work for, and to do so at scale and speed. I'd love to be a young engineer, a young entrepreneur, a young social scientist, investor, even a young politician, with all this still to play for, where the stakes are so high, but where the potential rewards are so great. And thinking about this audience in particular, and throughout history, Sometimes for good and sometimes for bad, great families have played their part in radical transformations in our world. Often at the forefront of industrial revolutions, of social and technological innovations, and in shaping the foundations of our modern society. And I think we need to capture the same spirit of those pioneers and find ways to equip today's families with the ambition and the skills to deliver a different form of economic development one that puts sustainability at the heart of everything they do. Jump-starting new industries that would help us get to net zero or restore our soils, for example. Creating through their businesses, through the investments they make and the way they conduct their affairs, long-term social and environmental value. But also in that same spirit, to recognize the important and in many cases unique role that they can play as families in leading the change we need. Over the last decade, my organization in Cambridge has been working with some of the world's most influential families, and I've been very struck by their, their natural instinct to think very long term, but also by their openness to the need to create shared prosperity. The ultimate recognition that their wealth is dependent on the well-being of the system as a whole. We've seen firsthand how some of the more progressive families are now consciously investing in themselves building their capacity to lead change, but also learning how to unlearn, 
how to let go of their prevailing worldview or legacy behaviors, accepting the need sometimes to challenge the status quo, taking stock of their values, their purpose, and the contribution that they make to society through a fresh look at the notion of stewardship. Our role in Cambridge is to help families like these understand the risks that this century will pose for them, risks to their assets, their relationships, and to their position in society. We try to help them learn from the past and make better sense of the complex issues they face, but also to see the huge potential in embracing this new world, not just in responding to the SDGs and their 2030 targets, although this is crucial, but also as a means of reinvigorating their sense of family purpose and meaning for the next hundred years or more. Not long ago, we ran a wonderful program in Cambridge with next gens from three different parts of the same family. And at the end of it, they went home and persuaded, in fact, I have to say, almost forced their respective parents to come and experience for themselves what they had learned. It's sort of a case of putting young heads on old shoulders. And it was a wonderful opportunity for us to witness the strengths and strains of family relationships and how much power there is in sharing experiences through the lens of a higher purpose one that transcends personal, sometimes fearful, and even resentful emotions within the family and raises their sights towards a different shared legacy, at the same time unifying generations and increasing the probability of long-term success and sustainable wealth. So I'm delighted to be here with you today, to have joined the advisory board of this amazing initiative and, initiative and to be part of a community that recognizes the importance of families sharing ideas and opportunities that sees the bigger picture and importantly that also has the courage to report and hold one another to account for progress at a time when good leadership is so desperately needed and i look forward to working with you to make this happen thank you very much Thank you very much, Polly. I think uh, you all found very interesting the two keynote addresses that have painted the big picture of what is facing us all in the world, and all in particular, uh, the business, the family business community. And um, there's doom and gloom, but I also think there is, uh, there is hope. We'll work together. And um, you have the leadership role in our program. So I think a lot of family businesses will also um, be calling on you in the future. What I would like to hand over now is to a moderated panel discussion where we will hear from the very people who now have to take what we've heard today and introduce that and transform this into the future of their businesses. And for that purpose, I would like to give the floor to uh, our moderator, Alexis Durodublicki, for he's the CEO of Family Business Network, and he will be working you through the panel members and the future discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian, and thank you, Jeffrey and, and Pauli, for these inspiring uh, keynote uh, addresses. It's a pleasure to be here today for the launch of this groundbreaking initiative, and, and I'm honored to introduce our four panelists today. Uh, first, Barbara Cooks, well known to many of you, a former executive at uh, Philips and Siemens. Uh, today, a, a reference on sustainability and corporate governance, sitting on the boards of many business families, uh, Henkel, Grovener, also as vice chair of uh, Firminish. We have also two leading figures of our community, um, André Hoffman, uh, vice chair of Roche, a, a passionate advocate of sustainability, uh, a dedicated FDN member, and also someone who is helping us to learn on how to unlearn. Uh, he's created with his uh, wife, Rosalie, a few years ago, the Hoffman Global Institute for Business and Society. Uh, in partnership with INSEAD and really helping the new generations of business owners and, and business managers to rethink how they want to do business. Um, the next panelist is our chairman at FBN, uh, Farhad Forbes, uh, co-chair of his uh, family business uh, group, uh, a leading Indian uh, steam engineering and en energy conservation company. And, and Farhad has been really continuous pushing us to, to, to bring forward sustainability as a core mission of, of FBN. And last but not least, Nicolas Fleury, 
uh, from uh, ISO, uh, Deputy Secretary General of ISO for more than three decades. He's been really uh, helping ISO to come forward and bring not only indicators, but management tools to help businesses better manage their uh, activities. Um, as we've heard from uh, Jeffrey and Polly, we are at a tipping point. We all know that the enormity of changes accelerated by COVID have left us uh, with no choice but to track progress and report transparently. And as Alfonso told us, family business matter. They represent two thirds of companies, 70% of GDP. And for decades, for generations, they have felt and they have done the right thing. They've done it privately. And as we see a more transparent world today, we realize that many of us are actually lagging behind on ESG, environment, social, and governance disclosure. And that's why with the launch of this initiative, we want to see how we can turn this challenge into an opportunity, into a competitive advantage, and in a way bring the, the moral case of our values together with the business case. So I'm gonna ask uh, Barbara first to uh, help us see how we can achieve that and then invite each of the panelists to, to share their views on that. And then we'll, we'll embark on a conversation and I can suggest to all of you participants, if you want to start asking questions on the, on the Q&A tool. Barbara. Great to be here. Um, I looked yesterday at the importance of sustainability on Google, 864 million hits. And also when I see today the participation, the interest of family companies in sustainability is clearly there. Now let me have a look at the perspective. So family companies have always taken sustainability, let's say seriously in two dimensions. They always looked or most of them looked not just at the short term, like maybe sometimes publicly quoted companies, but they have always considered the long term. And in Germany, you have this great expression, Enkelfest, resilient for the next generation. What a nice word. So this dimension has always been. And in addition, I would say most family companies, even more than publicly quoted companies, have always looked at the so-called three Ps, people, planet, and profit. So. It's nothing really new, but we have heard the situation now is, new, is, is accelerating. Publicly quoted companies are moving big times. Investors are pushing. So what is there for family, uh, for family businesses? And I will just come up. It's not easy based on my experience in public companies, but also in private companies. But let me just shortly give you a five step approach what to do. So first one is really to look at the business opportunity in your company. And I've never seen a company, I've never seen an industry where sustainability doesn't create a business opportunity. So look at market attractiveness, look at competitive position, look at, you know, all the green things that are coming up and there will be a green spot. I'll take the example from Philips, not the family company, but a very simple example. There we said, it's green lighting, it's LED. That's the, the green sweet spot for the company. So when you go back, have a look at your portfolio, have a look at the market and say, where is this green sweet spot for in your company? The second point obviously is then to integrate that in your strategy. So not create a separate program, but then really to say, how do I integrate that in my overall strategy? The third one, is to have a structure. Now, family companies are not always big and anyhow, big companies and big structures are not always very helpful. My experience there is create a network, a network structure, don't have new people, but existing people and basically integrate them in this and especially use your young talents. Because young talents, I see it from my students at university, they're even more interested in sustainability and they have new ideas. They think out of the box. So that's on structure. The fourth point is measure it because we all know what gets measured gets done. Very few KPIs, especially non-financial KPIs. And my recommendation there is few, less is more. And also try to align it with KPIs that exist 
from publicly quoted companies, because then you can start to benchmark, which is always a nice thing. And the last point, the fifth one is walk the talk, meaning you really need to ensure if you want to, you know, position yourself as a sustainable enterprise, you have to make your homework internally, walking the talk, meaning in your factories, with your product safety, with your environmental standards, with your suppliers, with your employees, and so on. So really make sure, especially, I think, as a family company, that you have covered all these risks and that you're managing this process. And then to conclude, uh, two things. I think what's very important in on this platform, that it, that's why it's great, James and Christiane, that you are setting this up, and Alexis and the whole team and uh, the advisory board. So first, I think what's very important is to cross-fertilize, you know, to learn not some, some things will not work, you know, others may work very well. So also to learn, let's learn from each other. And, and the last point for me, that, which is really, really important, we are in a not such an optimistic environment today. We see it all around the world, okay? Now, there's a fantastic quote from an American philosopher who lived quite some time actually during his life in Germany. His name is, maybe some of you know him, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And he said this fantastic thing. He said, nothing great has ever been achieved without enthusiasm. So I wish us all a lot of enthusiasm. I have it. I would like to contribute. It's great to be here. And I look forward to hear the comments from my panel colleagues later on. Thank you very much, Barbara. And indeed, you mentioned measuring. And, and, and this is at the heart of what we're going to be doing with this initiative, providing measurement and management tools to family businesses so they can benchmark and, and better manage their businesses. Talking about enthusiasm and optimism, I think André is a perfect transition to André, who's been, in a way, a chief optimist officer for the sustainability movement in, in business families. André, tell us a little bit how you have managed over the past almost two, three decades at Hoche and, and around it to, to bring that sustainability agenda from the, the moral case to the business case? Well, <clears throat> very difficult to be more enthusiastic than Barbara. So <laughs> very nice that I can be immediately after her. Um, thank you very much for having invited me to share some, some, some views today. It's, I, 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 I truly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Now, um, if you're asking me about um, um, how we introduced sustainability in the family business, um, I can tell you about our own history and the, the way we've been, we've been developing over, over the years. But I also would like to sort of say that uh, uh, the fact that, we meet, that we're meeting exactly a year after the first case of COVID-19 was identified in Switzerland is also an opportunity to, to talk about this issue in a, in a long-term basis. And I think we, I will come back to that later. Um, within Roche, um, uh, family owners, um, fourth generation, um, we, we over the years started to realize that in fact, we were not in business in order to satisfy shareholders, but we were in business in order to uh, find solution for patients. So um, what, what um, early on the family realized that um, the long-term future of the organization went for the fulfillment of our purpose and our purpose, we defined it 20 years ago, is doing today what the patient needs tomorrow. We in the business of health, health is a complex um, business and it has in particular very long development cycles. So we need, um, we need time. Uh, and in order to have time, you need stability. Long-term ownership, and it's not only family ownership, which is long-term, some other ones are long-term as well, but in that particular case, the family ownership has provided stability, which has allowed us to come forward with new therapeutic solutions to unmet medical needs. And that, I think, is something that characterizes what, what we are doing. But if I come back to, to, to the pandemic, which has really sort of challenged quite a number of the things we are doing on a daily basis, I think the thing it's made absolutely clear in evidence is that our current system is not really fit for purpose. In particular, it's not resilient enough to survive uh, exogenous shocks. Um, we've been trying to focus for a long time into creating a, a long-term culture and um, something as small as a virus, which is not even a form of life, uh, has been able, to, has not been able, has succeeded in, in destroying a good part of our uh, social systems. Uh, 
And I think that should be very much a wake up call and should allow us all, not only in family businesses, but also in, in business at large, to refocus our activity. In fact, there is urgency. If we don't uh, find a way of continuing to create value in the for the benefit of all, we are in danger of losing our rights to exist. And if you are talking about family businesses who think in an intergenerational way, you want to make sure that the next generation still has something to manage or still has something to influence. If I want the children of my children to still have the same amount of influence on the company that I have now, then we are going to have to reinvent a, a way of doing business which is inclusive and which is uh, uh, using natural resources in the best possible manner. So I have no doubt we will be able to come back to the issue a little bit later, but for me, the important and the sort of generational problem we're having, and uh, uh, Pauli Curtis has written extensively about this, is this notion that we do have quite simply an accounting problem. We run our businesses on, 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 on the wrong metric. We, we, we focus on the short-term profit maximization, which is just not appropriate. The life is not just about money flows, life is not just about GDP, life, life is about um, all sorts of different factors, and in particular about the four major capitals, the social capital, the human capital, the natural capital, and the constructed capital, which is the result of the three first ones. Um, we had um, uh, last um, week the publication of the Das Gupta Review, Das Gupta Review in Cambridge, which has demonstrated the impact of businesses on uh, natural resources and in particular on biodiversity. We are currently over consuming the planet at a rate which is not sustainable. And so if you want to, to think long term, we are going to have to, start to act long term. And bus family businesses, and I welcome very much this initiative for sustainable development, because uh, family businesses have this notion of trying to think much more long term than others. It's something that's been done instinctively. We have not perhaps reported very cleverly about it in the past, but now it's time to come up, demonstrate the benefit of thinking long-term, and in particular, changing practice of other businesses who are thinking much more short-term. So I have this vision, and maybe I'll finish on this, I have this vision of uh, family businesses and family business management as being some sort of Trojan horse, which we can enter into uh, the, the wall of the city and hope that the city will pick up that way of doing business and change its practice in the long term. I could add to that the image of a virus being injected into the body, but that's a bit too close to the board, so I'm not going to go there. Thank you very much. Thank you, André. Thank you for that, for that image and, and insisting about the next generations being being a part of it. We will hear later on from uh, Sumitra Aswani, who's one of the leading members of our next generation community about why she's so committed to, to that agenda. And, and thank you, André, for reminding all of us that we have a, an accounting problem. And we will come back to that with uh, with Nicolas Fleury uh, later on. But moving on to, to Farhad now. Farhad, who embodies really more the, the other part, the, the silent, a part of family business having done the right thing for for many generations and and now as a community we're being sort of uh, faced and and have to equip ourselves to be fit for purpose and ready for uh, becoming more open and transparent Farhad, in your own uh, family your business and and in your country india the the largest democracy on earth today how, how have you experienced that that transformation from seeing it as a challenge to to an opportunity Thank you, Alexi. And uh, if I could just begin by first, uh, you know, wearing my FBN hat and thanking uh, James, uh, Christiana, and uh, Alfonso for leading this initiative uh, and partnership, and also um, the keynote speakers and the other panelists here uh, uh, this this afternoon and evening. Um, Alexi, to answer some part of your question, uh, I'd like to just start by just saying a few words about our, our business. Um, we are a family business, we're third generation. We're about 75 years old. Uh, we are privately held, uh, not listed. So we are you know, the other part of uh, what, you, what you started by mentioning. Our business is actually energy conservation and process automation and control for industrial plants. And some of these plants are polluting plants. And uh, 
uh, what we try and do is actually to minimize that and to help them improve. Our purpose, we're also, um, you know, like most family businesses, uh, we believe we have a sense of purpose and our purpose actually is energizing, energizing businesses and communities worldwide. Um, our products and services help customers save energy to improve their process quality and throughput and to help them run a clean and safe factory. Uh, as I said, we've been in business for 75 years. We've, we are third generation family business. And over the years, we've had to make several choices for what businesses to be in. Businesses that were aligned to our purpose and which would not compromise our values, which are essentially family spirit, integrity, excellence, and good citizenship. And sometimes this has come at the cost of growth where we've consciously turned down opportunities that could contribute revenues and profits in the short term. And you have to make a choice on some of these things. Good citizenship where we can make a contribution to the community has always been a part of our purpose as again, for many family businesses across the world. Um, and rather than just practicing philanthropy, which obviously we do, but we also believe that it's important to involve ourselves in causes that make a difference to the lives of people in the communities in which we operate. And in, in, our, in our small world that we live in, um, we focus on primary health, primary education and women's empowerment, which is you know, a very important element um, in life, uh, particularly in countries like India. The pandemic has brought home many, many things. Um, and we all, like many other family businesses, went through some very difficult times. India's lockdown was extremely severe in March, April, and May of 2020. Unlike in many other countries uh, where the lockdown affected personal movement, in India, almost all businesses um, with the exception of a few essential services came to a complete standstill and all business activities stopped for two months. We lost two months of revenues and it opened some questions which we had to deal with. And we decided that not a single employee should lose his or her job, that all our vendors should be paid on time or ahead of time, and all our contractors should also be paid so they could in turn pay their staff. Many of you would have seen heart-wrenching images of migrant workers who are daily wage, daily wage earners uh, walking to their villages. Um, this is because we do not have a social security system. There is no health or unemployment benefit that people have here. And so as far, it drives home the importance of the social inclusion part, which Jeffrey Sachs spoke about in his introductory comments. And it very much drove home to us what a long way we had to go uh, to make a difference in this particular area. Many of us in our family businesses feel that, you know, we do good things in our own businesses, for our own employees, for our own people and we have good work practices, but we need to take that beyond just our own narrow circle. We need to take it to our vendors. We need, it, need to take it to our contractors and we need to make a difference to the people for whom this really matters, where if they lose their job, they have nothing to fall back on. They have nothing to eat the next day. Uh, they may not have a place to stay the next day. So those are the elements which we have to also be concerned about. And this pandemic, you know, despite, you know, uh, in spite of, you know, bringing attention to all the important elements about what the environment has done for us, uh, or what the environment has been affected by us, the social inclusion part is, is, set, is as important for us to address. Um, I'd like to address 
the point that you raised, Alexei, in your introduction about the reporting and why it's necessary. Many family-owned businesses all over the world have been doing good things, as you mentioned rightly. Uh, and that's prior to and during the pandemic and will continue to do good things in future as well. But four things are very clear today. And some of these, uh, forgive me, Barbara, because you, you've mentioned this earlier. Uh, number one, we all need to create a more sustainable world. It's very clear that we need to create this more sustainable world and we all have a part to play in it. Second, while we individually may be going, doing good things, we need to scale our efforts significantly. Third, there's much room for improvement. And where we address some aspect of any, one of the ESGs uh, or a set of ESGs, there's certainly scope to address many more. And the more we can address, the greater will be our impact. Number four, having um, to make improvement and to achieve many meaningful results, um, as was mentioned earlier, you need to have a framework. You need to have a framework to measure, to track and review, and then to act. And in manufacturing companies, you know, we, we follow many Japanese management practices and they have a term called PDCA. It's plan, do, check, and then act. And as you said, rightly, Barbara, if you don't measure, you can't make improvement because you don't know where you are. And then finally, it makes good business sense. And again, you alluded to this. Um, it makes good business sense because you can attract and retain good people. It's more and more important today, young people who you're trying to attract are looking for more than just a good salary. They're looking for a sense of purpose for the company that they work for and that what the company actually stands for. And then second, it helps the company's brand value and reputation whether it's for customers, vendors, the government, the community in which it operates in, in fact, all stakeholders. So this is really what motivated us to participate in FBN's Polaris Initiative. This started you know, about uh, uh, seven years ago uh, and, and today to be one of the pioneer family businesses in the FBN UNCTAD partnership. And we feel deeply privileged to be a part of it. So I'll just stop there, Alexi. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fahad, and thank you for uh, explaining to us in details, you know, in, in your own family and your own business, what it means to to walk the talk every day to to make sure that all employees uh, are, are stay on board in times of crisis, to to pay providers on time, uh, and to continue to do the the, the good things. Um, and you measured uh, there's much room for improvement, and and we need to check. And it's a perfect transition to to hear from Nicolas Flory. And I want to thank Nicolas, uh, especially today, because he had to step down from some uh, important governing board meetings at ESO uh, that are taking place this week. So Nicolas, as André said, we have an accounting problem. So um, in this soup of, of indicators and this endless debates of which indicators are the right ones, uh, help us understand a little bit how we can move beyond the indicators debate and really start to check act and, and, and change our behaviors as, as business families. Thank you uh, very much, Alexi. I'm not sure if I'm going to provide you with an answer about uh, the indicators. And this may be something that we could discuss a, a little bit later, but let me start by saying that it's a great pleasure for me to be part of this event and be a member of the advisory board. Uh, like many of you, I believe that we are at a pivotal moment, not just for family businesses, but for businesses of all types, institutions, organizations, and ourselves as, as responsible citizens. I think that the COVID-19 pandemic created that sense of urgency that was necessary to accelerate the movement towards a sustainable world and to take actions, as it was already said. I think it helped understand that sustainable development is not just about climate change, but that all the global, global risks exist, such as infectious diseases precisely, the natural resources crisis, cyber security risks, or the increased erosion of social cohesion, just to name a few of those risks. 
If we may feel overwhelmed by the current crisis or scared by the risks I was just mentioning, I think it's important to see them as an incredibly rich source of opportunities. From this angle, it's a unique moment in time, provide us reasons to be optimistic. To me, the characteristics that uh, the family business that you, Alexi, were describing in the introduction, such as doing the right thing, have a positive impact on communities, thinking long term, but also the notions of preservation of assets and stewardship, often at the, at the heart of family businesses, mean that family businesses already possess some of the essential components to develop the right mindset to catch those opportunities and deploy successful sustainability journey. For me, a right mindset means for business owners and business leaders to be genuinely convinced of the importance of sustainability, to elaborate a vision inspired by the opportunities offered, and to make sustainability deeply embedded into the core of the strategies, not just an additional layer to their activities. Doing so will allow saving costs thanks to uh, eco-efficiencies, stimulate revenue growth from sustainable innovations, improve reputations with stakeholders, and also lower the risk that we face. Um, one of the challenges is, I believe, how to ensure effective rollouts, execution of sustainability programs, how to implement the mechanisms and systems to move towards the sustainability objectives defined by businesses, family businesses. And this is where international standards, those developed by ISO, but also those developed by the IC and the ITU, the other two international organizations developing international standards, I think play a fundamental role. Standards are indeed the tools between the definition of a sustainability objective and the reporting activities that we were just uh, discussing about. Suppose, for example, that you want to reduce your energy consumption by 20% within two years. A standard will provide you with the management system that will allow you to reach this objective. As some of you already know, as a, as a collection of more than 23,000 international standards in almost all possible sectors and domain of activities. And these are tools for all types and size of businesses. The fact that these standards have been developed in a neutral environment through a multi-stakeholder approach, that they represent a strong global consensus among these stakeholders and are recognized globally can help family businesses demonstrate to their own stakeholders their performance and the value that they create through their activities and processes. I just would like to mention a few of these standards. ISO 9001, probably uh, our most famous standards, which allows businesses improve their operational performance and which is based on the P PDCI cycle that Farad was just uh, talking about. ISO 14001, allowing to improve an organization environmental performance. ISO 26000 on, on social responsibility. ISO uh, 50001, which allows businesses improve their energy efficiency. Or last but not least, ISO 22301, allowing businesses to be resilient through business continuity management systems. Something critical these days, but we could see from an ISO perspective that not that many businesses implemented such approaches. So I can only strongly encourage family businesses to look and identify the standards they can use. These, these tools are there, they are available to you. Um, I know that this exercise often relates to the mapping that businesses have to do with the SDGs. Uh, we were talking about that also. Here, from my experience, it is important to focus on a, number of, uh, on a selected number of SDGs or ESG criteria, those where businesses can really have a material impact and not try to cover all possible goals and criteria. To ease that exercise, we have developed uh, in ISO a tool mapping standards with the SDGs and which is available on the ISO website. And this can be some of the steps that family businesses can take in their sustainable, uh, sustainability journey. Thank you very much, Nicola. And, and we really look forward to working with you and, and ISO to, to bring you know, that capacity of, of better manage and better work 
on, on, on the way we, we measure and, and we manage. Uh, we're now going to move to the, uh, an exchange uh, and there's some uh, very interesting and, and uh, relevant questions that are coming to us. Um, one of them is around the, uh, several of them actually are on the theme of uh, um, investors uh, uh, and, and owners. And, and as we were saying, I think Andre, uh, um, Andre was pointing out to that is how do we as a community also influence uh, the rest of the business world, uh, the capital markets, the financial investors. And, and you know, as we see in our community, many families are reinventing their legacy businesses and they move from being just a, a, a legacy business, an industrial a service business to a, a family office or, or a series of uh, investments. Now, how do we sort of continue to keep our values, uh, measure them, and then you know, take them beyond our own community to uh, the rest of the, the financial investor world. Uh, some of them being leaders in that aspect, uh, some of them imposing new regulations and rules. Uh, you know, when you go to a bank for a loan today, uh, you need to answer on, on many ESG uh, disclosures. And how do we sort of do that as we move beyond uh, one sector, one industry businesses to, to a multiple set of uh, activities and, and the link between the legacy business and the community and the family widens. Maybe, uh, I don't know who wants to, to start on this. Uh, well, I'd be very happy, I'd be very happy to take it. I mean, um, I think that uh, we need to sort of look at two different levels here. We need to look at business business as a force for good, business as part of the solution to the problem that business has created. The short-term profit maximization based not on ISO rules, but on perhaps on GAAP rules uh, has been uh, has, uh, uh, pushed forward this notion of short-term profit maximization. And every business decision has been taken in, 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 in respect of that particular approach. How do we maximize short-term profit to keep shareholders happy? And I think that has shown as being a dangerous system. Uh, we were talking before about the sustainability development goal. The SDG goals were uh, developed to counteract that particular nefarious, inf nefarious effect of business. So why do uh, family business play a role in this? Because they do think in this longer term horizon. I know we always come back to the same, to the same metric, but the fact that you have to leave something for the next generation to manage has to do um, with, with the fact that you create long term indicator. And um, uh, the idea that only financial uh, results matter is not fit for purpose. I mean, it worked well for the Millennium Goals, which allowed us to, 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 to raise a lot of people out of poverty, but at a huge cost to social, environmental, and human systems. And I think it's very important that um, uh, going forward, we measure the impact of businesses on these systems, on these capitals as well. The social capital, the human capital, the natural capital. And this is a huge opportunity. Managing impact, managing impact in a, in, in a sensible manner to, you know, to create long-term value without overexploiting natural resources and social systems is the key to the future. If we do that properly, business is the solution to the, to the, to the overconsumption of natural resources. So I'm looking forward to being able to see more and more of this indicator being published and pushed forward to be able to um, harness the impact that business are doing in a positive way, the business are having, sorry, in a positive way on the state of the world. Thank you, André. And, and that's why we at FBN are very happy to, to partner with UNCTAD because we know that UNCTAD with its ecosystem, with ISA, with you know, the International Standard and Accounting Reporting Body is also uh, very influential in the countries. And we know that sooner rather than later, we will all face those local regulations inspired by, by the work that UNCTAD does. And not only publicly listed companies, but also private companies will have to start to, to report proactively on, on those indicators. Uh, Farhad, you were nodding at one point of time about the fact that indeed, you know, it's important to go beyond financial results and being able to measure all of that. How, how do you do it? I mean, how do you go uh, you know, how do you move beyond the standard financial accounting department to sort of uh, reporting not only on how you impact with your business, but through, you know, your clients, your customers and your providers, uh, how, how you, you make a difference? 
yeah. throughout the well, value well, chain? One of the things, yeah, sure. Um, I think it also comes about from choice of business. So, uh, you know, if you have the ability to choose your businesses that you get into, um, and if you can create an opportunity for yourself um, where you add value to your customers, which in turn actually help the ESG goals or the SDGs, um, that actually is a great way to actually create shared value. It creates shared value for you, you get your customer, whether it's to save energy or whether to improve their processes uh, such that uh, they are more sustainable. Uh, and in the same time, at the same time, it's, it, serves, it serves your own business. Um, if you can create, if you can create an opportunity where you have underprivileged uh, people from your community, where you're able to provide them with an opportunity and it helps your own business, it's a shared value which you can benefit from. So it's a question of what we choose to do. And if we choose the right things, we can make the right difference. You know, maybe it's simplistic, but you know, I think some of these things are in our control. And uh, there's a question here about how you balance costs with, uh, with uh, sustainability. And I think, um, it's through choice, it's through individual choice, doing the things which, which make a difference and perhaps doing less of the things which don't. Thank you, Farhat. And talk, talking about choice, Barbara, I was going to ask you exactly because one of the, 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 the places, the spaces where choice takes place are the boards. And, and, and tell us a little bit how, how you, you see that happening at the board level and where the boards are sufficiently equipped and have the right skills and the right people to consider uh, those uh, trade-offs. Yeah, that's a very good question. But also to come to your first question, I mean, the point is there are family businesses, but there are no family markets. And so family business compete in an open market space against all companies, family companies and publicly quoted companies. And we all know markets are tough and challenging. And especially now, I think post COVID, to really rethink your portfolio and reconsider, is this the portfolio that is ankle fest, so resilient for the future? I think it's extremely important to really go through it in a, in a very, very good way because you want really to make it uh, sustainable sustainable in the in the in the long run so and the second point of course on the on the on the on the measurement uh, basically the financial kpis measure the past performance so it's basically history you know how good were you last year in terms of cash flow assets and so on profitability and revenues the non financial kpis are much more an indicator for the future performance so I think for family companies, maybe even more important because they want to make it ankle fest. So they want to really make it resilient. And, you know, a couple of, let me give you an example. I mean, would you invest in a great startup company that has performed excellently last year? <laughs> Take Tesla or something like that. But you hear that the net promoter score, that's the measurement of customers, and the employee engagement score, that's the motivation of your people, is really bad. Maybe you would reconsider. And that's why I think these non-financial non -financial KPIs are important. You know, when you look at, the, so these are just two factors, maybe to the first question. On boards, obviously, becomes more and more important, I think, the strategic aspect, because it's more challenging today to make a strategy than probably has ever been. <laughs> and, and these are, we heard it before, I think from Polly, you know, these are really long-term choices. And uh, so these are really very challenging tasks can be learned, you know, on, with an MBA or when you work like I did for McKinsey or other companies, there are, there are processes that you can really learn that. And then of course, in, in applying it, but also the topic of sustainability. And I think here clearly 
uh, I think more could be done in boards. And I think what you're doing, this platform is also great. And to I think in the, on the advisory board, we need to think how we can, you know, maybe find a way to convey sort of the wisdom of sustainability to the board members of the family of the family companies. Thank you, Barbara. And hey, I wanted to ask you, uh, because there's a question about resistance. We know there's a lot of resistance. And uh, you told us that, I think, in, in preparing this session, that 15 years ago, you created a, a, a committee at the board of Roche on, on CSR and sustainability. And, and it was very much a family, a top-down approach. How have you managed to sort of uh, work with the resistance uh, uh, across uh, the company and, and the group and, and really convince, just beyond the fact that you had decided to do it, but convince people to, to embark on this, on this journey and, and join you beyond measuring financial results? So <clears throat> you give me an opportunity to, to, to come back to one of my obsessions. If you, if you ask the right question, you very often get the right answer. If we employ, and at the moment we employ uh, around 100,000 people, if we employ 100,000 people and we tell them your job is to make budget, we're not telling them the same thing as if we tell them your job is to fulfill our purpose, which is doing today what a patient needs tomorrow. And so we need to come out of this conversation about financial results and about accounting. And we need to go into purpose, we need to go into missions, we need to go into value-driven type of um, uh, type of um, from exit. How do you do that? Yeah, um, it, it's out of the question that you uh, manage value as a managerial function. It's very difficult to impose that sort of thing. It has to be something that comes from the bottom up. So what you can do as a board, and as an owner in particular, is signify the, the fact that these things are important. We did this in Roche. Um, it's 17 years ago, actually. I, I, I checked this organization. Um, we, we started a, a committee, a committee on sustainability and corporate governance. And uh, we just asked the organization, please uh, do tell us what sort of impact we are having uh, on the society in which we are, not only in terms of finance, we have, you know, hundreds of accountants doing a very good job at giving us precisely a minute by minute what it is we're doing, but we don't really know how we impact the communities in which we are active and how we fulfill our mission. So give us some indication of what's happening. And suddenly um, a, a lot of the employees started expressing themselves through this medium and came to us with ideas how we could improve our energy efficiency, how we could uh, uh, promote more women, how we could do something about including minorities into the way we do businesses. It became a sort of general task shared by all. And then, uh, over the last 17 years, the journey has transited to today, the realization that it is impossible to manage a company like ours today without taking into, impact, uh, into account the impact we are having. And so it's no longer something that we have to, 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 to push down uh, because we would not have been able to do it anyway. It's more the opposite. In fact, uh, some of the employees challenge us quite regularly about how can we go further? How can we make sure that we really impose new things? For instance, if you look at CO2 emissions, you know, we've been very good at managing scope one, scope two, but scope three is still completely out of reach. So how are we going to be able to do something for humanity? How are we going to be able to regenerate natural system and do something about CO2 emissions? even in scope three, um, while continuing the, 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 what we said before, I mean, the company has to continue to serve its purpose. We cannot uh, become an NGO, we are a company, and we need to do all this profitably uh, while fulfilling our mission of helping the patient. So there's a whole succession and cascade of virtuous conclusions that come from using these metrics. And uh, Barbara, I don't agree it is non-financial metrics. It all contributes to the result at the end. Managing to the best possible way of the whole of the, of the, of the three uh, capitals we, dis we, we defined before is in the long term uh, a beneficial thing for the company. And uh, if we can make that obvious, then we're making a big step forward. Thank you, Andre. Interesting to see that it's part of a, a cultural shift that you had to bring to the company. And, and one way to do it, instead of uh, answering a checklist or metrics, is continuing to ask the questions. Uh, on, on those uh, elements uh, of, of environment, social and, and governance practice. How are we doing on these? And, and probably give the voice uh, to different layers uh, of the organization and, and keep on uh, asking them so they can answer. And probably from an innovation point of view, come up 
with uh, some interesting ideas. Um, back to Nicola, uh, as we talk about, uh, and we deep dive into this, this, this metrics issue, uh, there are questions around how do we measure values? How do we measure culture? Uh, how do we bring that change? Are there some, uh, there's a question around the B Corp model also that, that many of you are aware of and, and we at FBN worked with them for, for many years. How do you see the sort of the metrics aspect uh, move towards this more dynamic way of, of, of managing and uh, the, the business and also changing the culture uh, towards a more sustainable business? Yes, uh, I saw that particular question on, on B Corp. And I think here that uh, any kind of initiative, I would say that support, uh, you know, sustainable development uh, should be welcome. The problematic with these uh, approaches is that this actually, what, what we can see now is a multiplication of approaches and, and schemes. Uh, and, and this can generate actually uh, confusion, uh, possible increase of costs, and can in the end uh, ultimately dis dissuade all initiatives towards a sustainable development. And the other risk is that uh, you know, reporting or assessment becomes the objective in itself, uh, which presents the risk that sustainability remains as just another layer uh, in addition to uh, you know, the rest of the companies or business activities and not just embedded genuinely into, uh, into a, a strategy. I think that uh, uh, there is now a movement uh, towards consolidation and I see this initiative here uh, as an opportunity actually to consolidate and clarify what should be the indicators to be actually uh, uh, focused on that reflect actually that, that value. I don't have a precise answer at the, this stage to provide you, but I think it is important to try to help supporting that consolidation movement and identify those indicators which are really reflecting that value. Thank you, Nicola. And I think that that will be also the uh, what we will touch on in the, in the second part of the uh, of, the, of, of the, this event about what it means. I mean, there were there, there quite a lot of questions on which are the right frameworks uh, uh, to really help us measure and manage. And this mm -hmm. is exactly what we will be doing uh, in the second part of the, the session, but also over the next uh, month and years as, as we bring together and as we align uh, uh, on, on those indicators. Um, there was a question about how do we educate the ecosystem? and maybe we have uh, about five, seven more minutes to go. Um, how do we move from these individual initiatives uh, and, 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 and come all together? And, and you know, one of the important pillars of our initiative will be capacity building, which, which is the, uh, 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 what the UN is very good at doing and how do we go beyond our families uh, and the owners, but also the entire ecosystem uh, of the economy and how do we move forward uh, together with our community and, and with partners on this. I don't know uh, who wants to, uh, maybe Farhat, you want to say a few words on that? Um. Yes, sure. Um, you know, if you really look at things, I mean, you know, there are a few who can make really big differences, but it's also possible if many of us collectively make small but meaningful uh, moves. And I think that's one of the things that we can do within FBN. We are actually in a good position in FBN because we are an association of 4,000 family businesses, 17,000 passionate members, uh, of which a very large proportion, I mean, 40% at least are next gen, you know, who are even more passionate about sustainability than many of the senior gen. Um, so, because we we have, you know, we we are a, we are a network. We are we provide that community element where we have forums for getting together, learning, sharing experiences, sharing good practices. So we have those frameworks in place. So if we can encourage our members to sign up to the pledge, uh, start tracking progress. Uh, on these various indicators, which are now coming into place. Um, and many of, many of these indicators are already being practiced in some of our family businesses. They're already being practiced. It's more a matter of tracking and then uh, reviewing and then acting on them. And then 
thirdly, share the experiences. So we can, those of us who are doing something in a particular area where we can actually share that with others who can learn. And at the same time, we learn from others in areas which we are weaker in and which we need to learn from others on. So I think that's the thing which FPN provides. And I think if we can actually take this forward, we provide that opportunity for us to make, collectively make an impact and co collectively make a difference. Thank you, Farad. I think it's it's an important call uh, to act, uh, to act and to really start to establish within our, our businesses uh, the right systems, uh, the right structure, uh, as uh, as uh, one of you was mentioning, uh, to be able to to track, uh, review. And, and, and act. And I think until we can track, uh, we can't review and, and, and we can't act. Um, just leading to our uh, conclusion, we have five more minutes to go. Maybe I will ask uh, each of you to uh, share a final uh, thought, a final uh, call for action, uh, a final word to see how we, we take this initiative forward. This is an important landmark in our sustainability journey, which uh, you know, at FBN started uh, almost 10 years ago. And for 10 years, we, we work internally to inspire each other. And uh, just uh, uh, two years ago, as we were celebrating our 30th anniversary and re reviewed our mission, we added this, this new pillar, which is to raise the importance and awareness of family business in society. And, and that's why we embark on this journey of coming out of the closet, becoming more transparent. And uh, instead of uh, sort of being uh, concerned about what's happening on social media and how the next gen behave there, uh, more helping our senior members to, to be able to tell their stories more publicly and, and really help us move forward. So uh, maybe I'll start with you, Barbara, uh, uh, if you just have a few final remarks to share with us. Yeah, great. Uh cross-fertilization, I think, in, in, in the panel. And thanks, Alexis, for your great moderation. Well, when I look at it, when I take the energy level we have, when I take the knowledge and experience that is shared and also with all the participants today, and lastly, the family values, which are deep and which are have a sustainability element, I think, most of them, or if not all of them. And we take all that and let's go. And as you said, Farhat, step by step. So I very much look forward to stay in touch and look at the great progress we all will be making, uh, not just in the next years, but also in the next months. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Nicola. Yes, uh, I would make a conclusion along these lines. Uh, don't hesitate, go. Small steps are, uh, you know, very important, very precious. It's like, you know, the principle of the PDCA that we were talking about and management systems. We can start with small objectives and then we create that snowball effect. And that snowball effect can be multiplied by the number of entities and businesses going into uh, the same direction. So. Don't wait, let's go, let's act. It's the moment right now. Thank you, Nicolas. Great to have you on board. André. Uh, well, I, I so agree with the latest, latest statement. We have to do something now. Now, I would like to say something to family business owners. When we are family business owners, we are, if we are successful, and I assume that we all are, um, we get wealthy. Wealthy gets into the way of an awful lot of communication. Um, that they, they, it introduces a lot of layers which makes things very complicated. And so a lot of wealthy family businesses decide to become a big charity giver. I would like to say that for me, the best contribution you can make to humanity is not to spend the money you've made, but is to make the money reasonably. Make sure that you manage your businesses in the dimensions we've described very effectively today, according to the, the guidelines that we are going to set up time and time again and set out again, because that's the best possible impact you can have on humanity at large. I will give you an example. My father was one of the founding members of WWF International, the World Wide Fund for Nature. The World Wide Fund for Nature has 6 million members. Every year, 120 million patients take drug developed by Roche. 
Uh, not all of their manufacturer, I rush because most of the patent has, has expired, but we, 120 million people are being treated with our drugs. We don't save them all, but we save an awful lot. And so the, 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 the influence the family has been having on humanity is magnified by a proper enterprise managed according to sustainable ways. And this is not only a question of products we do, but also our footprint on the systems around us. We are a responsible uh, employee and we behave responsible towards our partners. And I think that's incredibly important. Secondly, if I'm, if I'm allowed another couple of minutes, um, I think that an awful lot of the focus we're having about, uh, about uh, impact is based on uh, metrics, it's based on measurement, it's based on reporting. What we need urgently, and that's not just for family businesses, but also for, family, for businesses around the, the planet, what we need urgently is management tools. How are we going to take decisions? How are we going to manage the resources? How are we going to manage risks that are coming towards us? Uh, um, and not only manage for reporting, but manage for value creation today. And I would really strongly encourage us to, to go along that path, giving people a toolbox which will allow them to go forward. And I think, uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to say that. Thank you, André. And uh, back to Farhad for the final remarks. Just want to thank everyone here for you know a very stimulating discussion. I always learn so much from fellow panelists in, in sessions like this. Uh, and I think just one thing which I'd just like to end on, and that is, you know, we do have a lot of talent in the FBN network. And over the years that I've been associated with it, I've learned so much from fellow members um, on family business governance issues, on various aspects of how to, you know, operate uh, and function in a, in, a, in a healthy family business. And I think if we address this challenge of sustainability together, uh, there's a huge amount of opportunity ahead of us. Opportunity for us in new business possibilities and ideas, uh, but also in terms of making a true difference in, uh, in some, of, some aspect of these. Um, sustainability goals. And in a partnership with, uh, with you all at UNTAD as well, uh, James, I think uh, uh, we have an excellent opportunity ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Farhad, and, and thank you all four of you for such an inspiring yet concrete uh, uh, panel. You know, last year at FBN, uh, our, our tagline was together apart due to, to the COVID uh, crisis. This year is forward together. And I think, you know, really what you are encouraging to do is, is move forward together. And as one of the uh, participants said, let's start small, think big and act fast. So this is a call for action. Uh, let's not forget to act fast. That is today, right now. Let's think big. And this is what this initiative, which will be formally launched in the next few minutes uh, by James and Alfonso uh, calls us upon to do. And let's start small every step and every individual action count. So thank you very much, all of you. And now I pass on the word back to uh, Christiane uh, for the formal launch of the initiative. Thank you very much, Alexi. And thank you very much to our panelists. Um, as uh, Farhad had said, it was a very inspiring, excellent and an insightful discussion. And since you've heard so much about this joint new partnership that we're about to launch, I think it's time to hand over to James to introduce what this partnership and the initiative holds in stock for you. James, over to you. Thank you, Christian, and also uh, thank, uh, thank you, Alexi, for moderating this uh, exciting panel. Uh, I wish to thank the distinguished uh, uh, keynote speakers and panelists for the insightful perspectives on the challenges and opportunities for business um, in the complex uh, global context and the way forward. Um, all speakers agree that family business with its special nature of multi, uh, a multi-generational vision and inherent concerns for sustainability are particularly well positioned to take advantage of the opportunities provided by the sustainable development agenda. Um, in my first meeting with Alfonso, as I mentioned early in 2019, uh, we discussed how business families, their firms, 
and the wider uh, family business uh, ecosystem could be empowered to seize the untapped opportunities arising from the global sustainability agenda and to make concrete and measurable contributions. We came up with this idea of a joint global initiative, but thanks to the support of all of you um, and your wisdom your, um, your, um, and your advice that now we have this initiative. So this UNCTAD and the Family Business Network, uh, we jointly developed this global initiative, which is called Family Business for Sustainable Development. Um, it is the first of its kind partnership between the United Nations and global family business community. The objective of this partnership is to provide family business worldwide with ways and means to integrate sustainability into their conventional business models. So as to contribute to global sustainable development and inclusive growth, as well as the prosperity of family business across generations. Um, the global um, joint initiative includes four components. It aims uh, at encouraging family business and their firms to commit to concrete, measurable contributions towards the sustainable development. The first component is the Family Business Sustainability Pledge. Uh, the pledge is entitled Defining Success Across Generations. It is a global call to action for business owned families, their, fa um, their firms, and the wider uh, family business ecosystem to promote a more purpose driven business model and to advocate and uphold the, the, the guiding principles. So there are four guiding principles sustainable growth, environmental stewardship, social inclusion, and good governance. This is all reflect in a, in a, in a statement, uh, one pager is on our website. In line with the SDGs, the pledge is a global statement, visionary and strategic, and also actionable and deliverable. Signing the, the pledge is a first step to embracing the sustainability agenda. But how do we move from uh, struct, uh, signature to action? Um, the pledge is supported by a reporting framework that, in, uh, that encourages family firms to assess their sustainability performance, to track the progress and to showcase their contributions. I think the, 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 the panelists have already elaborated uh, on that and to even to advise further how we can do that. So that's the second component, the sustainability indicators for family business. As Alexi um, pointed out, um, there's a much discussion about best sustainability reporting standards and the most applicable uh, indicators. While public listed firms and the sustainability champions are reporting on several frameworks, the majority of the business enterprise, uh, family, the majority of the family enterprises worldwide have not even embarked on the sustainability journey yet, particularly in a kind of open, transparent manner. So the starting point for the sustainability indicator for family business builds on uh, UNCTAD guidance on core indicators uh, for entity reporting on contributing towards the implementation of the sustainable development goals. The core indicators were developed through a kind of extensive consultations and consensus building among the key experts in the world and endorsed by the United Nations Intergovernmental Working Group of Experts on International Standards and Content and Reporting. Um, that body endorsed 33 core indicators outlined the baseline reporting that uh, companies could, uh, would need to provide to, uh, to, uh, to enable governments and other stakeholders to evaluate the contribution of the private sector and, and, and that they are universal in nature and have been applied 
across industries, company size, and the different geographical regions. Um, and importantly, the sustainability indicators for family business also include um, ten, uh, nine measurements that recognize the special nature of the family firms and their efforts in contributing to sustainable development. So putting all these indicators together, it is the, the indicators for family business in particular. Um, several uh, family uh, firms have already applied the indicators and that their reports will be published soon by the United Nations uh, in a series of case studies. Um, here, I would like to recognize our first reporting champions, when we call them pioneers. That is um, the Forbes Marshall from India. That's, the rep that's represented by Fahar here, and he already elaborated his case, uh, the best practice. The second is the Raul Van uh, Virgi, uh, 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 Virgi Web, and this is from the Netherlands. And the third is the Sun uh, Textile from Turkey. It's represented here by the founder, Gunzeli uh, Ulutuki. Um, and she's going to present the case uh, to showcase um, her reporting experience. The third component. Is the, uh, is the global multi-stakeholder platforms. Um, to expand the reach and the voice of family business beyond their own community, uh, our World Investment Forum is the preeminent global gathering of investment development stakeholders. So today's event is organized as part of the, of the World Investment Forum satellite conference. Um, and other platforms include World Investment Network managed by UNCTAD. And in addition, we also have various UN fora that we're in partnership with that can also showcase the family business um, best practices. Of course, the Family Business Network International represents the largest global network, uh, business uh, network of business uh, families and firms. Um, so all these will be uh, combined a kind of um, powerful force as a platform. And we are also fortunate to tap into some of the networks, our eminent members of the advisory council um, um, and they are associated with. So combined the network and the global platform will help facilitate the contribution of family business to sustainable development and to showcase um, their achievement. So we at the United Nations are pleased to share expertise and the best practices derived from our global networks of investment development stakeholders. The fourth component is the capacity building program. Uh, to maximize the impact and the contribution by family business, a capacity building program will be developed to address the needs of family business and supporting institutions at the different levels. Um, we'll pay particular attention to the capacity building for SMEs and the family business in low income countries, those members of the family business and we'll pay special attention to. In conclusion, the mission of our initiative is to empower family business to think in generation and to act in sustainability. We promote a transformation uh, from traditional business model to one for sustainable development. Our operational strategy follows five Ps. I would put it in five Ps, meaning pledge for commitment, performance indicators for impact, platform for collective action, peer support for capacity building, and the partnership for synergies and global scale. The vision of our initiative is a global movement for sustainable family business. We invite all family business to join our initiative and our investment development stakeholders to support the initiative. We launched the initiative today 
and it will turn it into a global movement tomorrow. Together, we'll make it happen. Together, we'll build a sustainable future and to ensure success across generations. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, this is the beginning of a hopefully great partnership also with the help of our many of our panelists who have made this long term commitment to support us in uh, our future design of the program. But this is not just a partnership on paper. The Family Business for Sustainable Development initiative is the first global initiative of its kind between the UN and the Family Business Network. And now I would like to introduce to you uh, Sumitra Aswani. She is the executive director of Ix Tolaram Foundation in Singapore. She is a representative of the next generation and she has already started being engaged with the program. She has signed the pledge and Sumitra, please share with us what it means for you and what you hope to get out of this initiative and this partnership. Over to you, Sumitra. Thank you so much. And thank you very much for the enlightening conversations that have happened this evening so far. Um, as Alexi said, you know, we are I'm here to represent the next generation voice, and I hope that there are many more in, in the audience today. Um, just a brief thing, I'm, I'm a fourth generation from a family business called Tolaran, and we are headquartered in Singapore, but we operate in a lot of emerging market settings, in particular in Asia and in Africa. And uh, I serve as the ED of the foundation, but I also very much wear the hat of the next gen in the family business when I speak today. Um, I've been following the work of FBN since about 2010 when the original pledge was um, individually crafted and it was actually launched in Singapore um, that year and, and that was around the same time when I was starting to gain interest in our family business and starting to ask questions from my own father about what it meant to be a part of our family business. Um, and you know, this is around the time when I met people like Caroline and they started to talk to me about what it meant to be a flourishing business on top of just a family business. And the kind of conversations that other next generations were starting to have with their own families around where this business was going to go, what succession was going to look like, what kind of business we were going to subsequently inherit, and what we were going to have to do with it when we finally did inherit the businesses. So these were very new to me. But it became very clear to me that these conversations were ongoing way before, like in, in many businesses before ours, and it was not unique to me. Um, and that family businesses in particular were very well placed because of the values that we held, because of the long term thinking that we all shared and, and the way that we were so embedded in our communities to actually pursue this idea of being a flourishing business. This actually led me to do a sustainability master's under the leadership of uh, Dim Polly as well um, at CISL, uh, CISL and I, I graduated last year. And my thesis was on family business and sustainability in particular, looking at intergenerational conversations and what was the gap between the generation above me and mine in terms of how we were perceiving sustainability. So alongside this, of course, I was having real life conversations with my family, with the business leaders. And I realized that there was a huge gap in this theoretical knowledge that I was gaining and what was really happening and, and where we were at. And my internal assessment was really that we were not ready to have constructive conversations around sustainability in my family business. And many of my peers from the next gen were experiencing something very similar to that. But I was very convinced that there was a lot of potential for a business like ours. You know, we're 70 years old. We have people within the business who are very well intended, very highly skilled. And we, we work in emerging market settings where there's a lot of opportunity to also be exemplary. So I was quite persistent that we needed to start these conversations in some way, although I, I, I will admit that I had a conversation with mental management at one point where I presented the SDGs and I presented all of these ideas to them. And I was met with a room full of silence and it was very scary for me, but I also realized again that you know what I was journeying and what the business was journeying were two separate things. So there was also this side education alongside academic pursuits of what was really happening in our business um, alongside that. Of course, alongside all of this as well, FBN was evolving in this conversation and this partnership with UNCTAD. And now we've taken the pledge the next step, which is moving from a place of good intention 
very similar to our business and other family businesses to really thinking about how to put that into action and then subsequently to measure that, which I think is very, very encouraging. Um, I think as a next gen in particular, what we are really looking for is to be able to uh, have something to show for it. Um, you know, I think a lot of the time, and, and I saw this in my thesis as well, we are very well intended as next generations, but a lot of the time we don't have the autonomy or the skills to be able to do something. And, and my hope is that with these indicators, we will have that common language. And with the pledge and the capacity building that James has enlightened us on, that we will have that common language, not only to bridge that conversation between the generation above me and my generation, but also within the FBN community and other family business communities. So I personally signed the pledge because I think it's a really important step to signal this intention to continue to have those conversations, not just within, but around the business. Um, and I think it's really important for us in the next gen circles, as well as all of the other converts who are trying to effect change to come to that common understanding of even just the definition of sustainability, which I feel is problematic in itself. I think the pledge itself is relatively straightforward. And uh, I, I would encourage everybody to sign it, at least if it's not a first step or somewhere along the continuum of your journey. I think it's a good way for us to, like I said, have that conversation. And as next gens, don't ever underestimate how powerful your voice is in your father, mother, uncle's ears, because uh, after a few persistent conversations, you will move them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aswani, for this very inspiring statement and i hope we have a lot of next generation um, um, family members in our audience and uh, i'm hope we will hear more from you in the future uh, sumitra um, what you said is the pledge is a first step and it will outline where family businesses can get involved but as most panel members have also indicated unless you measure, you report, you benchmark, and you see where your starting point is and track your progress, it will be very difficult to see where you are going. And we have uh, the family business, uh, ind the indicators for family business, and we have had a number of pioneers, as James had already pointed out, whom we have uh, issued a certificate of appreciation, who have taken the time and the energy within their firms to go through the indicators and see how they're applicable they are and what it means for their businesses. And I'm very glad to introduce to you as Christian, you are muted. I'm very sorry that I didn't even... You need to uh, introduce Gonzali. I am very sorry. Gonzali, for you, I do it twice. I it's thought better. that I'm, uh, I'm not hearing yet this time. Uh, my apologies. I was waiting for the first technical glitch, but it didn't want to be me. So <laughs> no I'm, I'm very pleased after um, Sumitra has said the pledge is the first step. However, unless you begin to track what you are doing, unless you start reporting on it, and uh, that you're able to also compare with other companies and you benchmark your own sustainability performance, you will not really have a roadmap where to go. And I'm very happy to have Gunzeli. Gunzeli Unluturk, she's the co-founder of Sun Textile in Turkey. She has taken the time, like our other um, three companies, the time to look at our indicators, to test them, to comment on them and to see what it means for them personally. Gunzeli is also a pioneer of sustainability in her own country, but she's lent a, a helping hand for us in shaping this program and is part of our executive board. Gunzeli, could you share with us, please, what this reporting process has meant for you and uh, what is done for the company? Thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'm happy to be here and sh to share <laughs> our family business and our experience being one of the first to test the new sustainability indicators for family business developed by Antat and FBN. And also I want to thank Antat and family business for sustainability development team 
uh, having us as a pioneer in this uh, project. Uh, first, here is a quick background about our family business. Sun Textile has established in 1987, and uh, now uh, it's an award-winning textile company among the biggest uh, 200 companies in Turkey. Uh, we design and manufacture fashion products for our customers. They are all very well-known retailers. Sun Textile produces an average of 3 million pieces, fashion pieces, per month. Uh, and Ecotan, another of our business, is one of the largest knitting fabric producer in Turkey and also in Europe. Uh, both Sun Textile and Ecotan are part of Sun Group. And uh, Sun Gr in Sun Group, we have totally 1,850 employees and females uh, is 51% of our workforce. Uh, we are the first generation and our vision is to be a pioneer in sustainability in our country and in our uh, in our sector. As family business, we are actively involved in promoting sustainability in three levels. Through our business at a policy level in Turkey and through collaborations with our customers. In terms of our business, sustainability is an integral part of its strategic framework. We established Sun Group Sustainability Committee uh, to align company goals and contributions with SDGs and initiated five sustainability working groups in the company. Uh, one is product design development, human resources management, environmental sustainability, sustainable technologies and digitalization and corporate governance. In Turkey, our family business works with policymakers and stakeholders to, to advocate for increased adoption of environmental, social governance standards in general and for textile industry in particular. Our customers are all signatories of the Fashion Pack, a global coalition of companies in the fashion and textile industry, uh, all committed to a common core of key environmental goals in three areas, stopping global warming, restoring biodiversity and protecting the oceans. At Sun Group, we have identified four SDGs that we can make the biggest contribution. Uh, the first one is the SDG 5, gender equality, uh, SDG 8, decent work and economic growth, SDG 9, industry, innovation and infrastructure, and SDG 12, responsible consumption and production. Integrating sustainability into the core business and embedding sustainable development targets across all functions within the company is the key focus of the company. Sun Textile has, has also a number of uh, community initiatives. These include mostly women empowerment and livelihood programs and the creation of the Sun Textile Forest in 2018. Also, we use renewable energy in the company. Over the last seven years, Sun Textile and Ecotan started conducting a number of voluntary audits. We made this decision to improve our governance and increase our level of transparency. On the financial side, our reports are uh, audited by one of the big four independent audit companies. More broadly, uh, we work directly with many of our large clients, including Inditex, Tesco, Marks and Spencer, and Hennison Morris to continuously monitor and audit our activities and processes to ensure compliance with their regulations. In addition to improving transparency and advocating for increased adoption of ESG standards, we also 
actively engaging our employees, suppliers, and customers on this journey. In our determination to steer the company to low carbon future, we are focused on preparing sustainable collections for major customers. Our goal is to manufacture 100% sustainable collections by 2050. Our experience as one of the first family business to test the sustainability indicators for family business has provided us with the opportunity to, to develop some additional processes which will help close the gaps in our sustainability reporting. For example, we do not currently collect data on ozone depleting substances and chemicals and recognize this as a potential area for measurement. Uh, this process has also helped us to support development of our first external sustainability report, which has been released last month. The public facing report includes both, both ESG and SDG information. Our participation in this process has reinforced that the responsibility agenda as a whole is deeply aligned with the values and purpose of our business. Our previous reporting experience has shown us that conventional, conventional sustainability reporting and measurement frameworks do not accurately capture all the activities and contributions of family businesses. As a broader reach of both family and the business are not factored in the, into the other metrics. This is what makes uh, family business unique as beyond the contributions of the business are also contributions of the family, either as individuals or through the work done by the family. The fact that uh, this new set of indicators recognize the unique attributes of the family business make them a great fit for any family business, regardless of size. In closing, I want to echo the earlier call for all of you to sign the pledge today, uh, start transparently reporting on your progress. Uh, please keep in mind, transparency and reporting is very important for our customers, for our employees, all stakeholders, and the talents whom you want to attract. Let's get ready for our future. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Gonzeli, for your insightful account of how the program is translating into your own company. And now I have the pleasure to leave the final word to our co-chair of the initiative, Alfonso Libano. Alfonso, can you tell us what are your expectations for our initiative and the future partnership? Thank you, Christian. Uh, thank you, James, Sumitra, Gunseli, panelists, all FBN team attendants, dear friends, now that you know more about our partnership and why it's critical for every family business to get involved, I'm asking every one of you to take action today. The time has come for family business to step up and accelerate the work we all do to drive positive change in both our business and our communities. As family business owners and operators, we can no longer afford to quietly and humbly go about our business and hope that our actions will speak for themselves. We must proudly communicate our achievements while also being honest about our challenges. We need to transparently measure and report on our impacts. So we have the data required to build better businesses and better quantify the contributions we are making to society. Most importantly, we must show family businesses are leading the way through our firm commitment to sustainability in every aspect of our businesses. So first and foremost, I'm asking everyone 
again, here to sign the pledge today. If you haven't, please do it. And once you have signed, ask your families, your friends, and anyone connected to family business to do the same, because we need everyone involved in family business community to stand up and be counted. We need accountability. But the pledge is only the first step. As we have heard from all the speakers today, transparency is something every family business must embrace going forward. Measuring what happens, what matters, and reporting on impacts will be central to the future growth and sustainability of every family business. We believe the sustainability indicators for family business being developed through this partnership will be a great tool for every family business. So we hope you will consider using them as part of how you report going forward. So dear friends, let's go for it. Let's show the world what we are all about, that we are here for the long-term family businesses and that we are committed to delivering business solutions to some of the world's most pressing challenges. For the good, family businesses needs to have a strong voice for a better sustainable world. Let's make it happen starting right now. Thank you. Jingle. Thank you, Alfonso. Thank you, everyone. Well, we can say the initiative is officially launched. It's in your hands now to start taking advantage of it. And um, all the information that we've presented you with today will is on our website, fbsd.anctad.org. You will find the framework. You will find the reporting uh, framework and it will provide you a lot more background information. So I hope you all uh, enjoyed the discussion, enjoyed the event, extremely inspired, and we hope to see the pledge numbers go up in the coming minutes as we go live. <laughs>